The origin of the word pyramid is controversial. Most believe that it originates with the Greek word pyramis, which referred to a bread of conical shape. Life and death in ancient Egypt were modeled on the cycle of the sun. The perfect shape of the smooth-faced pyramid became associated with the metaphor of the pharaoh transformed into one of the sun's rays in death. Pyramids represented the Benben, the primordial mound of the Heliopolitan creation myth. These stories permeated every aspect of Egyptian life to a greater or lesser extent. During the pre-dynastic period, the development of funerary practices was different depending on whether one was located in Lower Egypt or Upper Egypt. Well before the pyramid, there was the burial pits. It is on the site of Marimde Beni Salome in Lower Egypt that we find the oldest funerary site, dating back to 5000 BCE. Study of the tombs revealed that the bodies of the deceased were deposited in a shallow grave in a fetal position. Though a few objects were recovered from these graves, they offered no insight as to the social class of those interred within. In Upper Egypt, pre-dynastic practices are easier to study, but reveal more complex funerary rites. They are divided into two cultural phases, Bedarian and Nagada. The Bedarian phase ranged from 4400 BCE to 3800 BCE. Small necropolises were discovered on the outskirts of villages, revealing the emergence of a funerary cult. The bodies of the deceased were lowered into an oval grave and covered with goat or gazelle skins. Items needed in everyday life were added alongside the body. During the three Nagata periods ranging from 4000 BCE to 3510 BCE, funerary practices evolved in complexity. The shape of tombs changed from oval to rectangular, mimicking the homes of the living. The size of the burials increased and funerary items became more stylized and numerous. Tombs gained complexity with masonry, wooden veneers, or raw bricks added to strengthen the structures. In time, socially stratified necropolises emerged. For example, in Hierakonopolis, the elite and commoners had separate necropolises. The term mastaba, meaning massive bench in dialectal Arabic, refers to a form of funerary architecture that was present in Egypt from the Archaic period to the Middle Kingdom. An evolution of the burial pit, mastabas were generally composed of two parts. A structure was built above the ground in the form of a massive rectangle with stepped walls, and a subterranean burial chamber was located underneath. Smaller mastabas often surrounded the much larger tomb of the king. These generally held the remains of the king's relatives and courtiers. The arrangement of the substructure of the mastaba evolved during the course of the Old Kingdom. From the 5th dynasty onwards, mastabas often featured multi-roomed substructures, with sometimes up to 30 rooms. Also, the quantity and quality of decorated surfaces increased noticeably, as well as the number of statues found within. The 6th dynasty would see art used to its utmost. The entire surface of a mastaba would be covered in scenes of daily life, illustrating the prosperity of those lucky enough to comfortably spend eternity near the pyramid of a pharaoh. 
The best example of this type of mastaba is the tomb of Mararuka in Saqqara. The Steppe Pyramid is at the center of an enclosed complex comprised of temples, models of palaces, and artificial constructions, all built for the afterlife of Pharaoh Djoser. The funeral complex itself covers 15 hectares and is located on the highest point of the Saqqara Plateau. It's clear from the elaborate detail and scale of the complex that this was a technological marvel of its time. The only fragment of information regarding the design plans of the complex was discovered on a section of stone containing an architectural sketch of a vault. The Steppe Pyramid is the first monument built of stone. Standing at 60 meters high, it was the tallest of its time. Built 4,700 years ago, it was originally intended as a mastaba, which was a flat-roofed rectangular tomb. Its famous architect, Imhotep, may have felt this was too humble for the great Pharaoh Djoser and began to add the steps. The Steppe Pyramid complex is enclosed within a 1,600 meter long wall that is 10 meters high. This large wall was made out of white limestone and oriented along the north-south axis. While there are 14 doors, only its eastern door was intended to accommodate the living. The remaining false doors were built as portals for the king's ka to pass through. Along with false doorways, the walls were designed with bastions and steeples resembling a defensive wall. The positioning of these design elements suggest that they were related to the Hebsed festival. The only real entrance into the complex is at the end of a long, narrow passageway. This enclosure has a stone canopy carved to resemble wooden logs. At the end of the passage is a large opening. Meant to resemble a doorway, it has carved doors and hinges that are permanently open and immovable. The corridor is lined with 20 pairs of columns up to 6 meters high, built by stacking stone drums. The completed facade was made to resemble reed stock bundles. Traces of red paint were found on the columns, along with black paint on the support walls. This would have had the effect of blending the walls into the shadows to give the red columns the illusion of standing on their own. Chambers are located on either side of the columns and are thought to be chapels representing the provinces of Upper and Lower Egypt. According to some Egyptologists, the arrangement of the rooms may be symbolic of jurisdiction and judgment. Guarded by a line of carved snakes, this tomb is located at the southern end of the courtyard. The burial chamber is beneath it, down a 30 meter deep shaft. The low ceiling chamber resembles a mastaba and is relatively intact compared to the later burial chamber. 
The tomb is made of pink granite, though there is evidence it was once polished limestone. Too small for a body, it is possible that the tomb was intended for the king's ka, or to hold the canopic jars containing the king's organs. Later traditions in burials would have the canopic jars in the same chamber as the body. A polished limestone staircase leads west from the tomb to underground apartments. Some of these rooms were intended to accommodate the king and his family in the afterlife. Many large jars of pottery were found, including some that still had deposits of beer, milk, and oil inside them. The false doorways are decorated with reliefs of the king taking part in rituals. In these reliefs, he is seen carrying agricultural tools, running, and performing a ritual for the reanimation of the deceased. The architect Imhotep chose stone as a building material in order for the complex to last. Following the completion of the initial mastaba, Imhotep devised a burial of more ambitious dimensions. He set about stacking mastabas on top of each other. Evidence shows that the pyramid was enlarged twice by additional cuts into the steps, eventually reaching 62 meters in height and 121 meters by 109 meters at its base. A staircase allowing the pharaoh to enter the divine world was represented by a tiered pyramid, oblong in shape, completely enveloping the original mastaba. The pyramid itself is a solid structure. All of the chambers and tunnels are beneath the structure. Pharaoh Djoser the Sacred was the founder of the Third Dynasty. He ruled for 19 years. During his reign, he was known as Horus Najeriket, divine of the body. He was given the name Djoser several centuries after his death as a sign of respect, and he is regarded as one of the greatest pharaohs of Egypt. An apocrypha was drafted in his name during the Ptolemaic period. 2,500 years after his death. Djoser was associated with the sky god Horus in his human form. A plinth near the steppe pyramid is inscribed with his name and associated with Horus. He was the first to reside in Memphis, making it the central hub of government for the region. Djoser was known to have built many temples and monuments before the complex at Saqqara. The funerary complex was the first of its kind and would mark Djoser's greatest architectural achievement. The funerary complex was built to resemble Djoser's palace with the stone carved to imitate mud brick, trees and reeds. Creating these details and softer textures in hard stone would have been a time-consuming, labor-intensive task. Much of the complex is designed to accommodate the Hebsed festival, allowing the king the ability to affirm his rule even in the afterlife. In the corner is a temple referred to as T. This temple is among the most mysterious structures in the complex. Its outer facade is plain, while inside it is decorated with intricate jed pillars and carvings. It's possible that this place was intended to be where the Ka of the King materialized, symbolically visiting the platform of the Hebsed courtyard from the afterlife.
The Hebsed festival enabled the pharaoh to maintain universal order and renew godly powers. Through a series of trials and religious rites, such as dance, offerings, and visiting the sanctuaries of various deities, the ruler's vital force and divine nature was confirmed. The celebration was meant to represent the ruler's jubilee and would take place every 30 years, though the deadline was not always followed. The earliest known ritual dates from the first dynasty. Within the complex of Djoser, southeast of the pyramid, is a dedicated space for this essential ritual to be performed by the king even in the afterlife. The Hebsed courtyard is lined with false chapels and equipped with a platform featuring two staircases meant to represent Upper and Lower Egypt. Located in the courtyard, the two pavilions are believed to represent the palaces of Upper and Lower Egypt. Rectangular in shape, the two replica structures face one another. Their facade is similar to the chapels of the Hebsed ceremony, with column crowns carved to look like falling leaves. Because Queen Hetep Hernepti and Princess Inetkas's names were discovered on a stela near the pavilions, it is thought that these funerary chapels were intended for them. The funerary temple is on the north side of the complex, facing the stars where the deceased ruler was believed to travel after death. Within this temple was the pharaoh's serdab, or cellar. It is a small, enclosed space with one wall sloped to match the first step of the pyramid. The north wall has two observation holes. A statue of Djoser is seated on the throne, wearing a mantle and a tripartite wig with a crown known as a Nemes. Representing the king's ka, this statue looks through the observation holes into the courtyard, enabling the king to observe the ceremonies and receive offerings in the afterlife. The architect of the Steppe Pyramid, Imhotep, was a man of great importance to Pharaoh Djoser and ancient Egyptians in general. The base of a statue of Djoser, discovered in 1926, celebrates Imhotep as a carpenter, sculptor, stonemaker, and chief of the seers. Little is known of Imhotep's day-to-day -day life. While he is credited for writing medical texts, it is for his role of architect that he is most famously known. From the design of the pyramid to the elements within the complex itself, Imhotep set out to create something that would immortalize his king. An architectural achievement, the steppe pyramid was made from stone blocks instead of mud brick. It was the first time Egyptians built a monument of that height. Imhotep explicitly intended for the stone to reflect natural materials. The funerary complex of Djoser remained famous throughout the centuries and millennia, and its great architect, Imhotep, was deified by ancient Egyptians during the late period. In addition to the central subterranean palace built for Djoser, 11 wells were dug, each went to a depth of 33 meters and connected with a horizontal gallery extending for about 20 meters. The first five galleries were intended for members of the royal family. Two passages lead underground and branch off in three directions to various magazine galleries. 
This vast underground space accommodated sections for storage and ceremonial offerings. One of the tunnels, starting on the east side of the pyramid, contained 40,000 stone vessels, many of them belonging to the king's ancestors. The burial chamber of Djoser is located at the bottom of a 28-meter deep central shaft. According to Egyptologist Jean-Philippe Lauer, the chamber was originally made from polished blocks of limestone, while its ceiling was decorated in five-pointed stars. At some point, however, the limestone blocks were replaced entirely by pink granite blocks, leaving behind only fragments of limestone blocks decorated with stars. At the foot of the chamber are many tunnels going in all directions. This maze of tunnels, galleries, and chambers stretches over five kilometers. There are a number of dead ends and false doors. They may have been intended for the afterlife rather than to fool thieves. Unlike the Great Pyramid of Giza or Menkara, the Pyramid of Djoser does not have any extra openings dug out by thieves. There was no need for them. Because of the easy access into the tunnels and along the corridors, thieves had little trouble clearing out the temples once inside. It is unknown when the mummy of Djoser was stolen. All that remained was a left foot, found by French Egyptologist Jean-Philippe Lauer in 1934. This architect, who devoted his whole life to meticulously exploring the complex, believed it belonged to Djoser. The Pharaoh's Apartments, also known as the Blue Chambers, are decorated with blue-green tiles meant to imitate the reed matting that covered the walls and windows of his palace. The stone is carefully curved and painted to look like the rolled mats of open doorways and curtains. There are two long rooms running side by side along a north-south axis. The south room has false doors separated by stone panels, while the north room is a corridor which allows access to side chambers. Nearby chambers originally housed the pharaoh's treasures. The door frames are made of fine limestone and carved with the king's name. As in the south tomb, reliefs are carved into the doorways. These reliefs show the king performing rituals and visiting divine sanctuaries for all eternity. Their interiors are fictive additions made by the team to add to the wonders of the tomb. It is clear from the elaborate detail and scale of the complex that this funerary monument was a technological marvel of its time. With the long reign of Sneferu, the first king of the fourth dynasty, the most brilliant and creative period began for the construction of funerary monuments in Egypt. Funerary monument design moved from the step pyramid to the smooth-faced pyramid, testament to the evolution of the practices of construction. The first attempt at this design was the pyramid of Medum. While Sneferu's monument started as a seven-stepped pyramid, 
it was later altered into an eight-stepped structure. The final phase of construction saw the steps filled out and an outer casing applied to achieve a smooth surface. The smooth dressing of the walls did not provide sufficient bonding, however, and the outer casing did not rest on sound foundations. As a result, the bases of the four outer buttress walls gave way, causing the walls to slide down and collapse. While the Maydoom Pyramid was abandoned due to design flaws, it showcased other innovations that would impact all future pyramid designs. As well as the smooth sides, it was the first time a ceremonial pavement was built, leading from the valley to the temple of the pyramid. Another innovation was that of the funerary chamber, which was no longer at the bottom of a well, but rather above ground level. This change signaled the beginning of the three-bedroom system. After the construction of the Maydoom Pyramid failed, Sneferu transferred his residence and the official necropolis to Dashur. There he began construction on his second attempt at a funerary monument. The resulting structure, known as the Bent Pyramid, is the only one of its shape in Egypt. Though the pyramid also proved unstable and was abandoned, it marked a technical and architectural breakthrough. Heralding an important design transition, the bent pyramid displays a shift from the step pyramid to a functional smooth-sided pyramid. The Bent Pyramid was unique in having two separate entrances, one on the northern face and another on the western face. The chamber of this pyramid was too small for a human burial. It was probably meant for the burial of a statue designated to house the Ka, the vital spirit of the deceased king. With the Bent Pyramid, architects successfully experimented with a completely new idea, to build the pyramid with a core of huge stones settled on a progressive horizontal design. This way, each construction phase could be completed in a single stage, allowing the architect complete control over every design element. Unfortunately, these precautions did not prevent sagging or cracks in the interior rooms of the pyramid. Sneferu abandoned the monument and began the construction of yet another pyramid. The Red Pyramid was built two kilometers to the north of the Bent Pyramid. It was so named due to the reddish limestone used in its construction. The Red Pyramid reached a height of 105 meters. While the ground level of the Red Pyramid is lower than that of the Bent Pyramid, its height is virtually the same. The task of making the pyramid a geometrical, true flat face pyramid brought about yet another new design concept the use of casing blocks.
The descending corridor of the pyramid, which opens to the north, arrives at ground level, where two almost identical spectacular chambers with high ceilings are aligned north to south and connected by a short horizontal passage. In the south wall of the second chamber, accessed by a staircase, another corridor leads to the final chamber, which is built within the masonry of the pyramid itself and aligned east to west. The annexes of the Red Pyramid consist of a small funerary temple located to the east. A causeway presumably ran due east from the temple, but it has yet to be excavated. The Red Pyramid was structurally sound and once finished marked a remarkable design milestone. Finally successful in his attempts to build himself a suitable funerary monument, Sneferu knew his future beyond death was assured. During the Middle Kingdom era, the powerful rulers of the 12th dynasty resumed the tradition of elaborate pyramidal tombs. For example, Amenemhat I built a funerary complex in Lisht, and Senusret II selected the Elahun site in the Fayum. Amenemhat II and Sesestris III, however, cast their favor towards Dashur. Amenemhat III built a pyramid there as well before moving to Hawara in the Fayum. The plundering of tombs in troubled times prompted the architects of the Middle Kingdom to devise increasingly complicated means of security during construction. As such, while the architectural plans of the Hawara Pyramid were simpler than the one at Dashur, the means used to protect it from looters were much more elaborate. Beyond the use of blind passages and concealed trap doors, the architects relied on a system of stone slabs which were slid into place at the end of construction. These massive stone slabs were meant to permanently block the passageways leading to the funerary chambers. The kings of the 13th dynasty began building their pyramids at Mazguna, south of Dashur, then moved on to Fayum and Abydos. The kings of the 17th dynasty, however, satisfied themselves with crowning their cave tombs with small pyramids of raw brick. The kings of the 18th dynasty gave up the shape of the pyramid as a royal tomb entirely. They chose a mountain with a pyramidal shape in the Valley of Kings and dug their graves there. It was not until the Nubian pharaohs of the 25th dynasty the kings were once again buried under pyramidal tombs. In fact, today, the area of ancient Nubia, modern Sudan, contains a record number of 220 known pyramids to Egypt's 138. Despite their slow decline in use and quality, pyramids continued to fascinate all and sundry up to the Roman era. They remain to this day a symbol of the religious dedication of the pharaohs and the grandeur of ancient Egypt. The Giza Plateau is located on the west bank of the Nile and was considered by ancient Egyptians as the domain of the dead. The pyramidal complexes found there were built over the span of three generations during the reign of Khufu, Khafre, and Menkara.
The Giza area, now famous for its three pyramids, is part of a wider grouping of funerary complexes. Rulers from this period generally elected to be buried in the area. The focal point of the entire region was the city of Memphis, chosen as the capital of Egypt at the beginning of the Old Kingdom. The placement of the Giza monuments, and particularly that of the pyramids, followed a practical yet strict alignment. First, they focused on cardinal points, and then they accounted for the natural geology of the plateau. A sphinx was originally meant to be a personification of the king. The human head, wearing pharaonic regalia, was fused with the body of a lion, thus sharing the qualities the powerful animal possessed, namely its power, the swiftness of its attack, and its majestic authority. By these very virtues, it was also considered a symbol of protection. Unsurprisingly, statues of sphinxes could be found along the dromas, protectors of the path taken by the gods to reach the temples. Over the centuries, enthusiasts and historians alike have wondered, who built the sphinx? For what purpose? And who does it represent? These questions remain unanswered. Several theories do exist, however, some more credible than others. One theory supposes that Jedifre chose to pay homage to his father Khufu by building the Great Sphinx of Giza. The stone temple on the eastern face of the Sphinx would have been added later on by his brother and successor, Khafre, in order to strengthen the divine worship of their father. It would be the first Egyptian temple oriented with the sun. Another theory suggests that the Sphinx was built by Khafre and was meant to represent him. The arguments to support this hypothesis are based on the fact that the limestone beds used for the main work of the Temple of the Sphinx are geographically and architecturally similar to the Valley Temple of Khafre. Some believe that Khufu himself built the Sphinx, which was later finished under his successors, Jedifre and Khafre. These arguments are based on the stylistics of the engraving, the typology of the memes, and the absence of a beard at the time of construction. While ancient Egypt as a whole leaves a rather monochrome vision of its monuments and statuary, it is vital to understand that in ancient times, absolutely everything was painted. The sun, eating away at the pigments of the colors, the sand, the climate, and the implacable impact of time, unfortunately destroyed the glorious colors of the Sphinx of Giza. Documents from an Arab Egyptologist of the 12th century, Abd al-Latif al-Baghdadi, indicate that traces of red were still visible in his time. Today, however, the only color that remains are traces of red close to the ears of the Sphinx, as well as hints of blue and yellow on the neems, traditional colors for that type of headdress. The pigments for the color red were man-made, obtained by mixing different products such as clay, quartz sand, and very finely crushed hematite. Red had a strong symbolism in ancient Egypt. It was both the color of life 
and the color of death. It could represent the sands of the desert or the brilliance of the sun. Red was also associated with the god Seth, vengeful and destructive. The Egyptian word for red, Deshur, is also the word which was used to signify the desert or the royal crown of Lower Egypt. In art, red was also the color used to paint the bodies of men, while yellow was used for women. It is possible that there were also color restoration efforts during the Sayite period about 600 years before Cleopatra's rule, as indicated by notes on the inventory stele, discovered in 1858 by Auguste Mariette. It is because of this that the team made the decision to display it with its full range of colors, even though the Sphinx's colors would have likely faded by Cleopatra's time. Dating from the 4th dynasty, approximately 2600 to 2500 BCE, the Great Sphinx of Giza is the oldest and largest sphinx that we know of. Carved from a natural limestone outcrop, the sphinx measures 19.8 meters in height, 73.2 meters in length, and 14 meters in width. In order to bring polish to the imposing monument, several blocks of limestone were added after the initial construction phase. Since then, there have been numerous attempts at preservation. The polish present in the game integrates some aspects of modern restoration attempts. The team made this choice to present a more iconic version of the Sphinx of Giza to the player. Today, the Sphinx is called the Terrifying One. This appellation is translated from its Arabic name, Abu al hol which in turn was derived from Baluba in Coptic. The Sphinx as a whole was carved in situ from a natural stone promontory. Its head was built in a limestone peak of the Mukatam plate, and the body was sculpted in the underlying rock layer where it is located. The degradation of the Sphinx is due in particular to wind erosion and the different quality of limestone used in its construction. The level of sodium contained in the groundwater which abuts the stone is also a contributing factor. The natural bedrock is seen through the oblique natural strata of the Sphinx's body that are similar to the surrounding limestone. Since antiquity, people have always believed there was a hidden tomb deep within the Sphinx. It is thought that attempts to plunder the Sphinx began as far back as the First Intermediate Period. Since then, numerous attempts to pierce the Sphinx's secrets have been carried out, leaving indelible scars upon the monument. Twelve meters long and cut during pharaonic times, another entrance in the back of the Sphinx aroused curiosity. Although Thutmose IV attempted to seal it off, it was possibly reopened by treasure hunters. It was rediscovered by Howard Vise and mapped more recently by Mark Lehner. This entrance at the back of the Sphinx leads to different cavities of a few meters each in directions going inside the statue's body and under the surface. The team has used this opportunity to extrapolate a little more. While there have been no major discoveries pertaining to the Sphinx of Giza in recent years, theories and hypotheses continue to emerge. Without validation provided by archaeological sources, however, they remain unsubstantiated. The first of the main theories as to the Sphinx of Giza's meaning 
posits that the Sphinx was originally a massive representation of the god Anubis. Its principal arguments are that the head of the Sphinx is disproportionate compared to the size of its body. The second theory believes that the representation of two Sphinxes on the stela of Thutmose IV would indicate that another stone Sphinx had existed on the site itself, possibly even in paired symmetry on the other side of the Nile. However, neither of these theories can be verified in any way. Several scientific projects using new technologies have been put in place in the past decades. The most important was led by Mark Lehner and his team, who specialize in the study and survey of the Giza Plateau, including the Sphinx site. The mapping made it possible to see the materials used to construct the Sphinx, analyze the different layers of erosion, and figure out the most fragile areas to protect. After a few attempts at giving the Sphinx artistic proportions, the team instead decided to use photogrammetry mapping to faithfully reproduce the proportions of the Sphinx. What the Sphinx of Giza represented during its construction and how the Sphinx was perceived by the Egyptians of the New Kingdom are two very different matters. Originally a representation of the king imbued with the power of the lion, the Sphinx was eventually viewed as a direct representation of the Most Divine. It is theorized that kings of the New Kingdom believed that the Sphinx of Giza was the one who recognized and legitimized the ruler of Egypt. Thus, despite the fact the Sphinx of Giza was partially buried under the sand during his reign, Amenhotep II knew that the monument was of great importance. Amenhotep II built a second temple dedicated for the Sphinx as Horamakhet to pay homage to Khufu and Khafre, his predecessors. It became a common habit for this dynasty to spend time with their royal courts at the Sphinx. Its sanctuary became known as Setepet, the Chosen. Egyptologist Mark Lehner believed that Amenhotep II built a statue of himself anchored between the paws of the Sphinx, likely to legitimize his reign alongside a stela found by Salim Hassan. Many other pharaohs of this dynasty, such as Tutankhamun and Ramses II, also left marks of their passage in a similar fashion, sometimes even stripping the stones of nearby temples and pyramids to do so. Amenhotep II's son and successor, Thutmose IV, was a frequent offender. While sleeping between the Sphinx's paws, the future Thutmose IV saw in a dream the god Horamaket proclaiming his coming accession on the throne of the two lands. This was, of course, on the condition that he remove all of the sand covering the Sphinx, which stood guard as the personification of the god and should thus never be engulfed by the sands of the desert. The 15-ton dream stela built by Thutmose IV to commemorate his dream was discovered by an Italian Egyptologist, Giovanni Battista Caviglia, in 1818, when he undertook the task of freeing the Sphinx from the sand, which had yet again covered it. Caviglia was looking for an entrance into the structure of the Sphinx, but instead he discovered an open-air chapel and stelas between the paws. Ashes from a ceremony were still present, Protected by sand, they quite possibly were from the last ceremonies in Roman times.
That same year, Cavilia discovered fragments of the Sphinx's beard that had probably been added during the New Kingdom. If many of these pieces are held by museums in Cairo, a fragment is displayed at the British Museum, along with a piece of the ureus that was on the Sphinx's headdress. It is believed this fragment of beard was possibly kept in place thanks to the statue of Amenhotep II, which was supposed to be located under the head of the Sphinx. A popular cultural legend purports that the nose of the Sphinx of Giza was lost during the time of Napoleon Bonaparte to the cannon fire of French soldiers in training. However, engravings from before the time of that campaign already depicted the Sphinx without a nose, indicating that it had been removed before the French campaign. The most plausible hypothesis is based on the research of the German historian Ulrich Harman. During the 1980s, Harman compiled medieval sources written by Arab authors. In doing so, he discovered that the Sphinx was once perceived as a favorable omen, a deity supporting sediment-nurturing floods and crops. Around 1378, a Sufi by the name of Mohammed Saim al-Dar could not stand this vision of the monument and in an iconoclastic act, broke the nose of the Sphinx. According to the texts, he was then hanged and burned between the legs of the Sphinx for his crime.